Welcome to UC Irvine's Illuminations program and to this exciting event featuring award-winning writer and conservationist Carl Safina. This event is co-sponsored by Lower Division Writing, the Humanities Core Course, the Center for Excellence in Writing and Communication, and the Masters in Conservation and Restoration Science. I am very happy that Linda Haas from Lower Division Writing has agreed to introduce Carl on behalf of the campus. Linda has taught Carl's books to many UCI students, and she is one of the people who urged us to bring Carl to campus. Linda, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Lupton, and thank you everyone for attending today. Um, and thank you to UCI Illuminations for sponsoring this event. It's a great honor for me to introduce Dr. Carl Safina today. His work as an ecologist, conservationist, and writer has had a significant and perspective-changing impact on many people, including me and my students. Safina writes that his work is driven by a devotion to free living things and wild places. His devotion is profoundly social, political, and educational. His New York Times bestselling book, Beyond Words, What Animals Think and Feel, is the one I've caught most frequently. Like all his work, it's eloquent, profound storytelling. His most recent book, Becoming Wild, How Animal Cultures Raise Families, Create Beauty, and Achieve Peace. His writing has won a MacArthur Genius Prize, Pew, Guggenheim, and National Science Foundation Fellowships, book awards from Lannan, Orion, and National Academies, and the John Burroughs, James Beard, and George Graff medals. He's written seven adult books and several books for young readers. He writes regular essays and opinion pieces in major publications from the New York Times to The Guardian. And he's done podcasts, radio interviews, TED Talks, and a PBS series called Saving the Ocean. This prodigious work is all in the service of fusing scientific understanding, emotional connection among species, and a moral call to environmental action. I'd like to shout out to all my 39C students here tonight. In our class, we read Dr. Safina's work at the Foundation for Understanding Current Research and Animal Science. His writing is approachable, insightful, and an excellent entree into the world of scientific research. Students choose a specific area of study like cetacean intelligence, or wolves' complex social structure, or elephant's ability to communicate in ways that humans don't understand. They learn about their adopted species and field of study, and they do, then they branch out to research the kinds of problems now facing their species due to human intervention in the natural world. Along the way, students realize that our framework for viewing animals and our relationship with animals and with the planet have been constructed in ways that favor human desire above all else as Sabina has shown us in ways both sad and wonderful. Humans have a fraught relationship with animals. Some we consider our best friends and companions we can't live without. Others, we relegate to lives of misery and torture for the sake of our entertainment, fashion, and cuisine. Rarely are we taught to see animals in the way that Safina teaches us to, as someone. They're not valuable because of what they can do for us, but because they're sentient. They evolve from the same origins, and we are interconnected. Like us, they think, they perceive themselves and others. They play, they mourn, they feel pain and loss. And they work together within complex cultures that we still barely understand. But animals and our planet are in trouble. We're now in the midst of a mass extinction event. A million species face extinction this century. Birds, mammals, fish, reptiles, and amphibians have all declined by an average of 70% in the last 50 years. Coral reefs have lost half of their living mass and scientists estimate a decline of 80% of the world's flying insects. We have caused these dire straits. Our habitat shrinking agriculture, fishing, logging, and mining industries, factory farms, urban sprawl, air pollution, plastic pollution, noise pollution, light pollution, and more. Humankind has, Dr. Safina writes, made itself incompatible with the rest of life on Earth. 
In the face of these statistics, it's easy to despair. But there's still hope if we're willing to reframe our relationship with animals and with nature. Dr. Safina's work in conservation and education through the Safina Center is part of the solution. In fact, his scientific expertise and environmental advocacy always comes with an eye towards solutions. In such a troubled time, his work is resolutely positive and open to, generative poss to the generative possibilities of human and, and environmental change. His work opens our eyes, not to chide us or to make us despair, but to invigorate us with hope. And so with no further ado, I'm pleased to turn it over to Dr. Carl Safina. Thank you for your life of Herbie work. And thank you for being here tonight. Thank you so much. That was a really beautiful introduction and I'm very, very honored to be here. Um, it's, re it's really, really wonderful uh, to be with you all tonight. Everybody's time is valuable and I really appreciate it. So, what I want to try to do tonight is to do one of the things that Linda mentioned, which is to do a little perspective changing and hopefully try to get you to look at animals in a different way. Let me go to some images that I want to share with you. I'm going to be talking about the ideas that are in my last two books, the books that Linda mentioned, Beyond Words and Becoming Wild. Beyond Words is about what animals think and feel, as it says, and Becoming Wild is about culture. Everybody knows that humans have culture, but we'll see that animals also often have culture. So often we are faced with a question about the pets that are near and dear to us. And that question often is, does my dog really love me or does she just want a treat? I'm sure a lot of you know that question and I'm sure a lot of you have looked at them and said, well, you know, they really seem to love us and, it, and it's pretty easy to tell what's going on in those furry little heads. But how do we really know what's going on in those furry little heads? Maybe it's really not so easy. One thing I think is easy is that something is going on. I, I think if the question is, are they having any kind of thoughts at all or are they having no thoughts? I think the answer is they're definitely having thoughts. But what about our own thoughts about them? Why is our main question, do they love us? That is not a question about them. That's a question about us, us and our insecurities. So I needed a different question, a question that might open a door. And my question became, who are you? Who are you is a very different question than do you love me? Who are you is about them. It's not about us. We know that we have capacities of the human mind, but are these capacities of only the human mind? What is going on in the other brains that share our planet? Some of which are pretty big, some of which are bigger than ours. It's really hard to look at animals and then conclude that nothing is going on. But for a long time, science said that this was not a scientific question because there was no way in, no way that you could actually address it scientifically. And that is wrong. There are some very good ways. You can look at brains. You can consider the gathering principle for all of biology, which is evolution. And you can watch what they do. And that's what we're about to do right now. Jellyfish were the first animals with nerve cells. But it's still the case that a nerve cell is basically a nerve cell, whether it's in a jellyfish or a frog or a dog or a chimpanzee or a whale or a human being or a crayfish. Octopuses are mollusks. They're not even vertebrates. Our last common ancestor with them was something that looked like a worm about 700 million years ago. And yet octopuses can use tools as well as can most apes and can recognize different humans and often develop preferences. There's some people that they like and some people they don't like. That's pretty interesting. 
If you look at vertebrate brains, they're pretty similar. Look here at two mammalian brains there on the left, a mouse brain and a human brain. And what do you see? You see that the basic plan is kind of similar, very similar, really. I mean, compared to an octopus that has eight brains, uh, the mammalian brain is very similar. And the human brain is basically an elaborate mammalian brain. And that's how evolution works. It takes the parts that are in stock and on the shelf, and then it fabricates a new twist. And that is evolution. If you look at a human brain and a chimpanzee brain, you see a tremendous amount of similarity. Basically, our brain is a large chimpanzee brain. It's a good thing that ours is large because we are the most insecure of all the apes. But uh-oh, that's a dolphin. Much bigger brain, a much more elaborated brain, a lot more detail. What can we tell from that? Does that mean that they are more intelligent than we are? It might mean that. It might mean nothing of the sort. It may be that their brain looks like that because they have sonar. We don't have sonar. And maybe a lot of that brain is given over to the fine processing of echoes from their sonar and sound. We can't tell just by looking at brains. You cannot see a mind when you look at a brain, but you can see the workings of minds in the logic of behaviors. If you look at this scene, you make sense of it exactly the way the elephants have made sense of it. And what they're doing is perfectly logical and perfectly relatable. They have found a patch of shade under some palm trees to let their babies go to sleep. The babies lie down and they conk out. And yet the adults remain standing, they doze, they are facing outward and they are touching each other because the world is a dangerous place. And we understand this just as they understand it because on the same continent, under the arc of the same sun, listening to the whoops and the roars of the same dangers and enemies, we became who we are and they became who they are. And we've been neighbors for a very long time. Our imperatives are essentially the same in the big picture. We're all mammals and we need to find enough food to stay alive, to keep our babies alive and uh, just get on with life day to day. That's the arc of a lifetime, basically. You know, just stay alive, raise a generation and that's it. Under the skin, although we look different topographically, under the skin, we have the same skeleton, just different shapes. We have the same organs. We have the same nervous system. We have the same endocrine system that produces the uh, neurotransmitters and the, uh, the brain chemicals that help to produce emotions. So some mammals are, are, um, are evolved for hiking in the hills of Africa, and some are evolved for diving under the ocean. But like the elephants, these whales have exactly the same skeleton that we have. In fact, in, in the flippers of a whale are the same bones, the same bones that are in your hand with the same fingers because they evolved from land mammals. They evolved back into the ocean to become aquatic mammals. And we would, we would say that happened a long, long time ago, but in evolutionary terms, it's really not that long ago. We remain very closely related. And uh, the changes have been very superficial and mostly having to do with the shape and topography of the outside of our body. So we see things that we recognize. We see help when help is needed in social animals, especially. We see curiosity in the young who are exploring the world for the first time and learning all the time. We see the deep bonds of family affection. Maybe I should say the deep affections of family bonds. 
And this is true not just for mammals. It's true for many vertebrates. Many birds have emotional bonds with their mates, long-term mates like these albatrosses do. Dancing is dancing. Courtship is courtship. It's quite recognizable because of the similarities. And then we often ask a question that is pretty silly, really. We look at these animals doing these things and we say, but are they even conscious? That's a strange kind of a question to ask considering everything that they do. What is consciousness? Well, if you've ever had general anesthesia, you know that you lose consciousness. You lose any sensory input from your eyes, from your ears, from your skin. You can't smell anything. You can't taste anything. You get disconnected from your sense organs. Then when you regain consciousness, you get reconnected to all your sense organs. You start to regain the ability to see, hear, smell, taste, touch. You've regained consciousness. So when animals are playing and they see each other and they hear each other and they're interacting, are they conscious? Yes, they are absolutely conscious. Sometimes people say that the thing that makes us human, this is a little bit of a minor obsession with a lot of people. What is the thing that makes us human? Sometimes people say, well, the thing that makes us human is empathy. What is empathy? Empathy is the ability of your mind to match the mood of your companions. And it turns out that with animals that live in groups, empathy is a very old emotion. When it's time to hurry up, you just hurry up. You suddenly feel the urge to move because everybody around you is moving. You don't have time to think about it. You don't have time to sit around on the beach wondering why did everybody just startle and fly away in a big hurry? Because if you did sit around on the beach when everybody fled, you wouldn't last very long. So the oldest form of empathy is actually contagious fear. Humans have a lot of contagious fear. Anybody who has any money in the stock market knows what contagious fear feels like. Everything in the living world exists on a continuum. There are no really clean breaks. So there's what I call basic empathy, which is feeling with another. You, you know, they're, they're startled, it startles you. They're calm, it makes you calm. That's basic empathy. Sympathy is feeling for another. You may not feel what they feel, but you understand it. So you say, I'm very sorry to hear that your great grandmother just passed away. Maybe you never met her. You don't feel the grief, but you understand that your friend feels that loss. And then if you are moved to action based on empathy and sympathy, then that's what I call compassion. Maybe you try actively to help something that you feel is unfortunate or is a problem or somebody who just needs some help. Far from being the thing that makes us human, human empathy is far from perfect. For one thing, we round up animals that are capable of feeling and are empathic with one another, and we eat them. And if you say, well, that's kind of a cheap shot because different cultures are different and humans uh, evolved as hunters. Okay, I'll grant you that. But we're not always so good to each other either. Far from being the thing that makes us human, we have a lot of work to do to bring our empathy to the level that we would like it to be and that we kind of tell ourselves that it is. People who know only one thing about animal behavior seem to know <clears throat> this very awkward word called anthropomorphism, which means attributing human thoughts and emotions to non-humans. And we know that that's not allowed, not allowed to do that. Well, science is not supposed to have rules about what you're allowed to do. Science is supposed to believe the evidence and believe what the evidence points to. So, you know, maybe there are some other species that have the kinds of thoughts and the kinds of emotions 
that humans have. Not all of them, I'm sure, just as we don't have all of their thoughts and their emotions, but some of them. And that's not projecting if observing them and studying them leads us to that conclusion. So I was telling all of this to somebody who was interviewing me one time and she suddenly stopped me and she said, okay, wait a second, wait a second. Now, how do you know that other animals have any thoughts and have any feelings? You're saying all this stuff, but how do you know? And I realized that the answer to her question was right there on the rug. When, when our dogs come over and uh, roll over on their back. They, they come to us and roll over on their back. They don't walk over to a chair and roll over on their back. They don't go to the dining room table and roll over on their back. They come to us and roll over on their back because they have a request. And that request is, I would like my belly rubbed. Can you please rub my belly? They've had the thought that they want their belly rubbed. They've come to ask for it. They know that we will understand what they're asking for, and they know from past experience that it will feel good. So they can think and they can feel, and it's not terribly much more complicated than that. If you think that's not scientific enough, well, we can look at real science experiments that involve technology that always seems to impress people. People have put dogs in MRIs and they show them pictures of strange people and pictures of people they know and they look at what happens to their brains. And they see that the same, the same activity patterns happen in their brain when they see a picture of somebody that they know and love, as happens with humans, when humans are shown pictures of people that we know and love, or maybe dogs we know and love. If you have dogs, you probably have seen them do what looks like dreaming, where they're sort of lying on the rug and they're asleep and they're their paws are twitching and they're kind of going woof, 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 woof. And you say, oh, it looks like she's dreaming. Well, what's happening here is there's a rat there sleeping, a lab rat. And those are, um, those are images of its brain lighting up during sleep, showing the kinds of sleep patterns that indicate in humans that humans are dreaming. Humans can tell you what they're dreaming about. Rats can only show you. And that's what you're looking at here. You're looking at a rat dreaming. Very recently, there was a new paper that came out that said that cuttlefish dream. Pretty interesting, I think. Now, what about this question of culture? We all know that people have culture, but we seldom ask what culture is and why culture exists. We look at the endpoints of culture. We say, you know, culture is sports or, or computers or, um, or religions. We look at the endpoints, but we don't really ask what is culture and why does it exist? Obviously, there is culture throughout the human world. Every, every human has culture. Every human group has culture. And the cultures vary a lot. They differ quite a bit. You can see right through culture, the basic humanity of all people, but the cultures differ a lot. What is culture? Culture is what we learn about how to behave, what to prefer, various habits and skills, um, things we are attracted to, things we think look pretty, that we learn from our social group and that flow socially. That's what culture is. Culture exists because it answers the question of how do we live here? And in answering the question of how do we live here, it helps us to all cooperate because we all live in similar ways. And it tells us who we are. It lets us have a sense of who we are and where we belong. When things around us change and culture starts changing, we have a hard time knowing who we are. So here I am with two Maasai women. One, this is in uh, Tanzania. One is pretty traditional and the other is pretty westernized. The, the westernized woman 
was a research assistant on an elephant project and working on conservation. And this is just a, a friend of hers from one of the local villages. Now that's, that woman that was on the right is there in the black hat against the door there. And what's happening here is this is in a park office where those men that are against the wall there, they were illegally grazing some cows and some goats inside the national park. And um, they were brought in to the office and they're being told that you know that this is not allowed and you can get in trouble for doing this. But they're being told this by a woman who in their culture has essentially very little status, doesn't really make any decisions. And here they're getting a warning by a woman in a uniform with the official powers of the national government. I think you can tell by the look on their faces how bewildering it is for them to experience that kind of cultural acceleration and whiplash. So where do we get our culture from? Mostly we get our culture from our mothers first. We get a lot of our culture from our mothers and then from our elders and then from our social groups. And we can learn pretty much anything depending on where we're born and what culture we're born into. If we're born in the Amazon, we learn how to live in a rainforest, maybe hunting monkeys with a blowpipe. If we're born in the Arctic, we can learn how to hunt seals on the ice. Once you know these things, you can live there and you can survive there. But if you don't know these things and you just get put there, you'll die. That's how important culture is. Culture is not just for human beings. There are a lot of animals that have culture that rely on culture to understand how do we live? What do we do? What do we do socially? How do we interact? What, what are the rules of dominance? What do we do when there's some sort of a threat happening? Cultures change for other animals as well. Here's a baboon with an adolescent and an infant, and their culture has changed quite a lot. It's changed mostly to include human beings and given them opportunities to do things that no baboon has ever done before, but they've learned and now they are transmitting a new culture. In this case, the cultural thing that is going on here is that as people are leaving the dormitories of this research station in Uganda, the baboons are going to systematically try to open every single door in the dormitory because they've learned that although the doors are locked almost all the time, somebody forgets once in a while. And when they do, it's a real jackpot. That's now part of baboon culture. Certain whales have culture too. Sperm whales are very cultural whales. In fact, uh, what's really interesting is that their social organization is a lot like the, that of elephants. They live in female families where the females stay in the same family for their entire life. They don't leave their mother. And then at adolescence, the males do leave. That's the way elephants are as well. Sperm whales have very deep emotional bonds. And despite the fact that they are really weird looking animals, when you watch them, they are very mammalian. They spend a lot of time in direct contact with each other. They dive for most of an hour and then they come up for about 10 minutes, then they dive again. And all through that time, they are staying together. They will be together for their whole lives in the vastness of the ocean. You don't do that by accident. That's very intentional. At, at the end of their dives, they come up, they announce to themselves and to each other who they are individually. It's me, I'm here, I'm coming up. I belong to the such and such family. And this family is a member of the XYZ clan of families. They have a layered social system. They announce those things by using patterns of clicks that are a, a lot like Morse code, a simple Morse code. 
that allow them to say who they are. And then they greet. Usually the greetings are very tactile, a lot of touching. So here's a little quick summary of these things that I was talking about. But what I didn't mention is that families form clans and those clans do things in a certain way. They may migrate um, either closer or farther from the coast. They may hunt differently. Um, and the clans do not mix. This is one thing that we see a lot in human culture, that culture brings individuals together to form groups, but then the groups tend to not mix or actually repel each other. And you can see that in quite a, quite a few other animals that have culture, sperm whales being among them. So these are orca whales or killer whales. Culture can bring individuals together. Culture can make the groups avoid other groups. These whales are really the um, extreme example of that because there are groups of them that have avoided other groups for something like 300,000 years and are really evolving into separate species. They do things very differently in terms of their feeding specializations. Some hunt only fish, some hunt only mammals. Mammal eaters don't think of fish as food. The fish hunters don't think of mammals as food. And to hunt fish or mammals requires a very different set of skills. If you're hunting mammals, you need to be in small little um, detachments and be quiet. If you're hunting fish, you wanna be in big noisy groups that can scare the fish into tight schools that are easier to attack. So as these groups specialize, the specialist groups will tend to avoid each other. Uh, a very easy thing about that to see in humans is with language. W people with the same language will gather into groups and can communicate and understand each other. People with different languages tend to avoid each other. They can't understand each other. They don't do things in the same way. So we tend to see animals and just put a label on their species. We say, well, there's a chimpanzee, there's some, uh, some orca whales, there's some elephants. This is not how they see each other. They see each other very much as individuals and individuals who have history. These are three males that are fairly high ranking. The two in the front, Hawa and Musa, are very high ranking. Hawa is the dominant male of his social group. And Musa was a challenger. Everybody thought Musa was going to win. Musa lost. So Hawa and Musa keep a very tight eye on each other. And it's not a very um, easygoing relationship. There's always a lot of tension. And they dispel a lot of the tension by grooming each other. Um, but they're always sort of testing boundaries a little bit. And then that guy in the back there, he's an up and coming young male, and they want to keep a close eye on him also because he has ambitions for higher office. <coughs> if you really look at chimpanzees, you start to see a tremendous amount of individuality that reflects not only the fact that they all have individual personalities, but they really have individual histories as well. And the researchers who've been watching them for about 20 years can tell you a lot of their history. It's, it's, they're very different individuals and it's very fascinating. Now in conservation, one of the gathering principles of conservation, probably the fundamental principle is called biodiversity, the diversity of life on earth. And we are taught that it exists at three levels, genetic diversity within species, you know, within any species, there are genetic differences among individuals, the diversity of 
species among species, the different species, and then the diversity, the, the diversity that is um, harbored in habitat types like grasslands or coral reefs or rain, you know, they all have a tremendously different array of gene pools. But this is all genetics. And does that really cover the diversity of life on Earth? No, because culture is biodiversity's overlooked fourth dimension. If all the individuals in a region get, get extirpated, get wiped out, their culture can die with them. And culture is a lot harder to bring back than just moving individuals into a region to try to reestablish a population that has been wiped out because the knowledge of how to live there has died. This bird is a thick-billed parrot. They used to live in the Southwest United States among a couple of other places. And in a, uh, an attempt to reintroduce them, they were bred in captivity and then brought to the habitat and the cages were opened and all of them died. There was nobody there to teach them what to do. Living in a cage and eating out of a dish is very different than being free living and having to know what food is, where food is, when food happens, what is dangerous, where the water is, and all these things. So there have been other examples also where introductions have been attempted and it has taken many generations, uh, maybe eight or 10 generations and a lot of mortality in between before they figure out things like, well, where do we go in the winter? We're up here in the mountains with all this nice grass up in the meadows, but now everything is freezing. What do we do? But, um, some introductions of things like bighorn sheep have had a lot of trouble because if nobody knows where the route to the lowlands is or where the lowlands even are, then um, if you're stuck for the winter and everything is freezing, you probably will die. So we may look at this picture and say, okay, there are three orcas there, three killer whales there, but that's not how they see each other. That tall finned male was 36 years old when I took his picture. That's his 42 year old cousin next to him. The researchers know these whales very well, but they've been together for decades. They've traveled many thousands of miles in the ocean. When they can't see each other and they're miles apart, they can hear each other and recognize their voices and get back together. Killer whales are particularly interesting because wild killer whales have never hurt a human being. And this one had just finished eating part of a gray whale that he and several companions had killed off of Davenport. And yet those people in the boat who are um, three of the best orca whale researchers in the world, they, they know they have nothing to be afraid of. And they're right about that. This guy had just finished eating a seal that he and two companions had torn into thirds. That seal weighed about the same as either of the people in that boat. But when the boat came around the point and they saw the whale there, they just stopped to take pictures. They knew they had nothing to worry about. They eat seals. Why don't they eat us? Why can we trust them around our toddlers? There are researchers, two groups of researchers in two different countries, the US and Canada, both have a similar story about trying to follow some orcas, to trying to keep tabs on them and learning where they went. This was a, a long while ago, several decades ago, and the orcas were being pretty evasive. And then they, they went into a, a fog bank and the, the people in the boat, in each case in the US and in the Canadian team, and this happened a couple of years apart from each other. In each case, they said, well, we can't see anything. Might as well try to find out where home is. And this was way before GPS or even Loran. So they looked at the compass and they attempted to go where they thought home was. And they pushed the uh, throttle up on the boat. And a couple of minutes later, the orcas that were being evasive were right in front of the boat. They said, well, let's 
follow the orcas. We're here to follow the orcas. Let's just follow them. And they went through the fog for several miles, in one case, about 15 miles. And suddenly the fog opened up and the researcher's house was right there on the shoreline. Now, what was going on with that? Were they really understanding that the researchers would be lost in the fog and leading them home? It seemed that way. Really not a good way to tell. In the Bahamas, there's a researcher named Denise Herzing, and she studies these spotted dolphins. She knows them all very well as individuals. They know her, they know her boat. And one time she went there, she usually goes for about a week at a time, a week on and a week off. And um, they went there one day and the dolphins were there, but the dolphins did not come to the boat as they usually do. They usually come and bow ride and jump around and act happy to see everybody. They were avoiding the boat and they were acting very skittish and kind of spooked. And uh, she said to the captain, what is wrong with the dolphins? And then somebody came up from below and announced that somebody uh, who was down there taking a nap died during his nap in his bunk. Now, how in the world would the dolphins know that one of the human hearts had stopped beating? Why would it matter to them at all? And why would it spook them? I don't know. But they went back, they did what they had to do with the man, and um, they came back out a few days later and the dolphins acted completely normal. Strange story. In South Africa, in an aquarium, there was a little baby bottlenose dolphin of nursing age, and her name was Dolly. And one day, uh, one of the keepers was on a break and he was just looking through a big glass window into their tank and he was smoking a cigarette. And the little baby Dolly came over to him and uh, looked at him. And then she just went back to her mother and she nursed a bit. Then she went back over to him and she released all the milk and it enveloped her head like a cloud of smoke. Now, when a human uses one material to represent another, we call that art. So what do all these strange stories add up to? Uh, a lot of them don't really have a good explanation that we know of. But what we can say is that there's a lot more going on in the minds that are here on Earth along with us than we, with our minds, ever tend to think about. The thing that I think makes us human is not that we do one thing different than all other species. Just about every single thing that humans do, you can see some of it in some other species. But we are the extreme animal. I think that's what makes us human. We are the most creative, but we are also by far the most destructive. We are the most compassionate, but we are also by far the cruelest of all of the animals that have ever lived on this planet. We are the extreme animal. But things like empathy or love, they are not the exclusive province of the human mind. There are other animals that have very deep emotional bonds to their mates, like albatrosses. I, albatrosses are a particular favorite of mine. I've studied them a lot. I've written an entire book about them. They take very, very good care of their babies. They travel for two or three weeks usually in order to get one meal to bring back, one huge meal to feed their young. They nest in tiny islands, usually off of large island groups, out in the middle of the ocean. This is where that last picture was taken on Laysan Island. It's about halfway between California and Japan, right in the middle of the world's largest ocean. We don't think about the albatrosses out there, but this is what their home looks like. They know about us all right, and they feel us. After going out foraging for two or three weeks and maybe flying five or six or 7,000 miles to come back to feed their chick, those meals frequently are filled with plastic. 
the plastic often smells like food to them. They ingest it, they come back, and the young get it as a meal. This young bird was about six months old, and it died, and it was packed with red cigarette lighters. Now, this is not the relationship we are supposed to have with the rest of life on Earth, but it is the relationship that we do have because we who have named ourselves after our supposed high intelligence, homo sapiens, the wise one, we don't really use our minds to think about the consequences of what we're doing. And yet when we expect new human life, we paint animals on the nursery room walls. We don't paint cell phones, we don't paint work cubicles, we paint animals. We don't even seem to ask ourselves why it is animals. But I've thought about that a lot, and I have a suggested possibility, of maybe the answer. I think we have an unconscious blessing for our unborn newborn, and that is welcome to this beautiful world. We are not alone. We have company here. And yet every animal you will see in any of these paintings, they're all endangered now and their flood is us. I talked a little bit about evolution. This seems to be the way evolution is going. It's not a great thing to have on our resume. This is a story we have told ourselves. It's called Scala Nature. And it, uh, the story is that we are the peak of creation. We are the perfection of creation. And the rest of creation is on this scale below us. This is really how it is. We're here, a lot of other things are here. They've made the whole trip. We are more recent. Many of them are more ancient. This is somebody's attempt to put all the diversity on earth into one graphic. And as you can see, it overwhelms our ability to understand it. Humans are not quite capable, really, of understanding the, the perspective of who we are, where we are, who we're with, how long all of this has taken. Now, this is my favorite bird, the peregrine falcon. In 1970, this article appeared assuring us that the peregrine falcon was going to be extinct, mostly because of DDT and other hard pesticides. It looked like there was no way out. Well, I was not going to sit still for that. And yes, that is me. And I worked on a project to help to bring them back. And it worked. When I was a kid, bald eagles were the symbol for important, big, beautiful animals that were going extinct. The bald eagles near extinction was one of the main drivers for the enactment of the Endangered Species Act. And they have come back really impressively. When I was a teenager, ospreys were completely gone from Long Island. There were essentially no viable breeding pairs left. A couple of old birds were trying to lay eggs that kept breaking because of the pesticides. It was like a big eraser on that species. And yet, 
because of the work of a few people who would not give up, they also have recovered incredibly, just incredibly. There are ospreys all over the place now where I live. Humpback whales, you know, save the whale. Whales were really on the ropes, really close to extinction. The humpback whale was one of the hardest hit. And now they're so common, you can literally take selfies with them. So conservation works. And when people refuse to accept death and defeat and destruction, we can do what's needed and we can turn things around. So I started this talk by asking, do they love us? And we're going to invert that question and say, do we have what it takes intellectually and emotionally to simply let them continue to exist on this only known living planet? Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Carl. That was amazing. I'm sure I'm not the only one who is on the edge of tears or in tears at this point. Um, your photographs, your witnessing, your science, your writing are all really, really moving. We Thank have you. a lot of questions. We don't have Great. a lot of time. Great. Uh, there's a question that I think is from a student, and since we are at a university, I want to make sure that we get some of our student questions in. Um, Ail asks, Dr. Safina, do you have any advice for someone starting their career that wants to work with animal conservation and behavior? Well, um, yeah, I... I I mean, I think it's just a matter of trying to take a few steps in that direction, try to get near people who work with animals in conservation. Um, I mean, I'm not sure what level you're at or even really what age you're at, but in my case, I, I hung around a nature center. I volunteered at a nature center. I, I volunteered to do some bird banding. You get to know people that way. More importantly, people get to know you. To make a long story short, that nature center that I volunteered at got me a job with a national environmental group, and I stayed there for 23 years. Um, so I recommend that reading, uh, reading about people who are doing things that really excite you and then trying to reach out to them and write to them can work. The person in my book who um, brought me to see brought me into the world of the, of the sperm whales, Shane Garrow. He wrote to his hero, a pioneering researcher named Hal Whitehead, who really pioneered the study of sperm whales. And he didn't hear anything back for months. And then suddenly a letter arrived and his entire life changed. So just take steps in that direction and network. And that is usually a really good way to get started. And education really does help. The more education you can get, usually, the more it helps. Thank you, Carl. There are a lot of questions here about um, conditioning versus consciousness. In a sense, it's that age-old philosophical question, how do we know that other minds exist, but now extended not just from our human neighbors, but our, to our animal neighbors? Do you want to just comment a little bit more on that? Um, you know, one person asks, how do I know that my dog is, is conscious and not conditioned? Or how do I know that it's love? Um, there's also a question about dogs using talking buttons to communicate. Whether you yeah, somebody has, uh, has these, these buttons that, uh, there are a couple of people who have buttons that these dogs are trained to um, use, what, you know, that, that 
but they step on the button and it says a word in English that has to do with, you know, going out or, or wanting to eat or wanting to play. And they use them appropriately. And uh, that seems to be a real breakthrough in getting them to sort of speak to us because we tend to be really dumb about it. You know, if a dog goes to the door and whines, it means the dog is telling you, I want to go outside. And, uh, and often we ignore them or we tell them to be quiet. And that's really, you know, it's not very insightful or very sensitive of us, but often they tell us about the basics of what they need. And, um, you know, conditioning has very little to do with the question of whether they're conscious or, or they're thinking. It's, it's a totally different thing. Um, I mean, you know, this question about love, for instance, um, what does love feel like? Love feels like a desire to be near somebody you love. Well, we have three dogs and every evening they come into the bedroom. They have little, uh, little beds on the floor and they come into the bedroom and they lie down on those little beds. They could stay downstairs. There are pillows on the floor downstairs. They could go on the couch while we're asleep too but they come to be near us. We don't feed them there. We've never fed them anything in the bedroom. They come because we're there and they like to be near us. That's, that's what love feels like. Well, there's a question here that maybe will be our last question. And it's really a request for you to repeat something that you said. Brenda asks, she says, stunningly beautiful, thank you. Could you please repeat your quote on love? There was love on earth before us. Could you share that comment again? Oh, I think it just says there, there was love on earth before us and there is love on earth besides us. And you, you, know, you see that in these very devoted bonds among many of these species. Now, not, not all species are social, not all species have long-term pair bonds or any pair bonds at all. There, there are many that don't, but those that do, their, their emotional makeup is different and it's a, more similar to what we understand as well. That's beautiful. And the idea of besides us, it seems to me that you're evoking neighbor love there and to really think about animals as our neighbors. Sure, who are sure. deserving of our respect and love. You know, and let me say, um, if you want to stay on for a few extra minutes, I'm happy to do that and go through more of the questions. Sure. That's very generous of you. I'm sure that our audience would love to hear from you. Um, there's a question in here about animal testing. And it's a sensitive question saying um, our, our guest says she, she herself has benefited from medications developed through medical testing, animal testing. Um, but where are we as a species and, and a culture in relationship mm -hmm. to that question? Do you have thoughts about animal testing for the development of medicine? Yeah, I don't know that field really well enough to know what is or isn't really necessary to achieve the goals that we are trying to achieve with those tests and experiments. Um, I have read repeatedly that many of them uh, really didn't find anything useful. It's certainly true that the testing with primates, especially because of their social needs, are incredibly cruel and drive those animals very literally insane. Um, I, Darwin has a, a very good observation that I think bears on this, which he says that unless the uh, un unless the experiment is absolutely necessary for our gain in knowledge, then it basically it shouldn't be done. Uh, you know, he's talking he's talking about the 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 pain that it involve uh, that it. Um, inflicts on other animals. And uh, I, I guess, you know, we could argue about what is a necessary thing that we need to learn. But uh, I also think that there's a lot of stuff that was not necessary, you know, for instance, 
testing cosmetics on animals to see whether they sting is, um, you know, to me, that's kind of frivolous. Why not just test people and see if they sting people? You know, why do we have to torment animals if we're not willing to torment ourselves? Um, some of the medical things, I think, I think there were very viable workarounds in doing things other ways. And I think that some of this developed just because it seemed obvious, but wasn't really the case that other animals were the best test subjects. Um, I'm not really sure where I could draw the line because I don't know that field well enough, but I have a very strong sense that a lot of unnecessary torment has been inflicted and continues to be inflicted. And how do you, how do you think climate change and global warming directly affect animals' emotional health? You've talked about other aspects. What about specifically the emotional life of animals during this time of change? I don't imagine that they understand that the climate is changing. Very few humans understand that the climate is changing. And um, yet they have to cope or try to cope with a lot of the changes. And many animal populations are declining. Uh, I mean, almost all free living animals, or what we think, you know, what we can call wild animals, almost all of those populations of, of every species is going down. And that means that we are making the struggle for existence much harder for them. So when there's when it's too hot and um, there's not enough water or there's a fire or something like this, then what do they feel? You know, they feel stress, they feel fear. They, that's how I think, um, that's how I think climate change is affecting them emotionally. Ecologically, we see a lot of effects, reduced, uh, reduced ability to breed, um, you know, to raise young ones, increased mortality, a lot of range changes, uh, a lot of declining populations related to climate changes. Okay, and this will be our last question. This is from my friend Amira Mansour. She says, thank you for a wonderful presentation. She too is near to tears. Are you more or less hopeful about our, spe our species' ability to muster up the empathy, wisdom, and knowledge to conserve at least most species? Well, I think if you're in the game, you don't worry about whether your team is going to win. That's for the people in the bleachers. You just try to play as well as you can so that your team hopefully wins. And, um, you know, I think we have a lot more awareness and certainly a, a lot of the information that we would need. But, I don't have to tell anybody here that information doesn't necessarily win the day. Compassion doesn't necessarily win the day. I, I think if if you you know if you look over the history of just the last few decades, I would say there's a lot of improvement in the understanding of what's needed and even in the public support for what could be done, a lot more human empathy toward other species. It is, it is not turning the tide right now, but the work is about turning the tide. That's what, that's what the work is about. Well, that's a beautiful note to end on. We really appreciate your generosity, staying with us past the hour, answering so many questions, sharing so much of your passion, knowledge, uh, your beautiful photographs. And, uh, and we just wish you um, good luck in this important work that you're doing. We've shared links in the chat, how you can support the work of the Safina Center. You can also read Carl's beautiful books. Uh, thank you and good night. Great audience. Thank you, Linda Haas, also for your beautiful introduction. Yes, thank you, Julia, and thank you, Linda. Thanks everybody who's watched. And, you know, everybody is really part of all of this. We all make a lot of decisions, little ones and big ones, every day, all the time. We can always try to do better. 
and try to support people who are doing what you think is the right thing to do. Nobody can be perfect and um, nobody can solve everything, but we can all contribute. So 